let me start off by saying Happy New Year because I'm not going to see you again until after the new year. But I wanted to make some comments about the new year coming uh, since this will be the last time we meet here before, before that occurrence happens. On Wednesday night, I believe it is, right? Wednesday night? New Year's Eve? Yes. Tuesday night, that's right, Wednesday is New Year's Day. Right. Okay. As we come to the close of another year and we embark on the year 2020, it's only natural for people to stop and look back at the last 12 months and what those things have entailed. And maybe you're thinking, 2019, what a year it has been. I certainly feel that way. Pastor Coleman retiring, and of course I had not personally met or knew our new senior pastor, John, and of course his lovely family, especially Evie. But I'm sure Addie and I are going to get close too, so I have room for both. So we're just so thankful for them. But those are two things that we certainly didn't think about a lot during the year that were very impactful for the year 2000. But maybe you look back at the last 12 months and you look at some of the personal experiences that you've experienced as, experienced additions to your family through births, marriages, and friends. Maybe new jobs, special events that you've celebrated like birthdays. And of course, loss of loved ones, diagnosis of disease, surgeries or sickness. And I want to tell you that Yvette and I have experienced both of those uh, this year, 2019. Obviously, my total knee replacement in February. And then, of course, Yvette being diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. Uh, so, it's, you know, those are tough things that we deal with. Anyway, we've all suffered through some of those things, and we've also rejoiced in some of those things. So, like Yvette and I have. When you stop and think about it, what the, what the year has been, and this, this is a time to reflect on that. And as we come to our scripture today, and I'm following along with uh, past, what Pastor John has been going through, the Gospel of Luke, um, you know, according to Luke, the good news and the great Savior, I'm going to continue where he left off. Obviously, it's pretty important that, uh, that, that Pastor John be able to hit Easter at the right time. So today, I'll be picking up where he left off when he finished in Luke 2, uh, 21, and I'm going to pick up in Luke 22 through 52. Uh, I want to give you a chance to, uh, to open up your Bibles. Uh, it's not going to be in the overheads, all the scripture. I know John usually does that. I want you to use your Bibles, and if you don't have one, in the pew in front of you, or in the chair in front of you, I'm sorry, uh, there are Bibles, and the, uh, the ESV on page 857. Uh, you can follow along uh, with this scripture as I read it, and I want to give you a second to do that, to uh, get that, or to turn to that page in your Bibles. And I want to ask you, when you do, to please stand in honor of, the, of reading the God's Word. Luke 22 through 52. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it has been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the, to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, 
Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And the sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years, from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up on that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard them were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why do you treat us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Boy, I can take a breath now. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, boy, a lot's going on here. I titled this, uh, my sermon for today, Jesus in the Temple as a Baby and Then as a Boy. Even though he seemed like a man at 12 years old, he was still a boy. So what happened here in the first trip to the temple in Luke 22 through 40? What do we see? Mary and Joseph go to the temple of Jerusalem for two reasons. And these are important. In verse 22, the first reason is, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, and Mary brought him, Jesus, to the temple to present him to the Lord. The purpose for Mary and Joseph going to the temple was twofold. They went to present Jesus to the Lord. He was 40 days old, and this was the first of many memorable trips. What happens in the Old Testament at 40 days old? Circumcision, that's correct. The person that was doing it was who? We talked about him you know, early on, Simeon, right? He was what they referred to as a moil. I'm pronouncing that correctly. I hope I am. Anyway, he's the one who performed the circumcisions. And that was, part, that was part of it. So that was important. The Lord told us in the Old Testament, people that had the firstborn male of every family, they also, it also says the firstborn male of every family was what? Was to serve the Lord. Was to serve in the temple. That child could either remain in the service of the Lord, helping the priest, or the parents could pay a small amount of money, a few dollars, to redeem that child, freeing that child from that obligation. So that was a decision that the family would make. The second reason that Mary and Joseph went to the temple was to offer a sacrifice as a payment for purification. This was for Mary. 
This was for Mary. Now this might seem a little bit foreign to us here today, but it was very common in that day because who, what, ha what was happening? You know, it was, what was happening is, you know, before Jesus came, it was rather a regular part of life. You see, there were many things that God said made a person unclean. One of those things was what? Was the shedding of blood. And when a woman gave birth, obviously there's the shedding of blood and that made her unclean. So she needed to be there for that. So she needed purification for the legal uncleanliness of childbearing. In order for a person to be purified of that uncleanliness, a sacrifice had to be made. Back in those days, yep, a sacrifice. This payment for purification was a constant reminder for all the Jewish people of the relationship with God. It reminded them of that relationship that's so important that we have with God and that they had at that time with God. So they had to have a sacrifice. This is why it is so good to see Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem. And you know, this is why Simeon sang and Anna could not keep from telling people. I, I don't want to underscore this. Simeon sang in verses 29 through 32, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen what? Your salvation. Christ, the Messiah, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people. So what, what is Simeon saying? He's saying, right now he's saying, I've seen Christ, now I can go in peace. You promised me. See, the Spirit came upon Simeon and he said to him, you will not pass before you see the Messiah. As I read through how Jesus was left behind by his parents at 12 years old, you know, the next part, what happens? 12 years, I mean, they came every year, by the way. Just, I want to recognize that. They came every year like they always did. So, but the next time that something major happens is, you know, when, when we get to verse 41, 41 through 52. And this is really something else that we see, you know, what's happening, you know, what's going on. And when he's 12 years old, and they made that annual trip for the celebration, the Passover was one that Mary and Joseph would, this one was one they would not soon forget. Yvette and I were watching one of our Christmas movies. We have quite a few of them at home. But we were watching Home Alone. Anybody seen Home Alone? Most of you, yeah, Home Alone, if you haven't seen it, it's hilarious. It's a good movie. It's a great Christmas movie, sort of. Uh, but it reminded me, certainly, certainly of what happened with Jesus' parents. Now you gotta remember what happened, and I'm gonna go into that more in detail, but what happened in the story of Home Alone is comparable to that. They have 12, they're an ex uh, uh, extended family. There's 12 kids and what, four or five adults. They're taking a trip from New York to France. And they're counting everybody and they get on the plane and what happens? Mom has this inner feeling and she goes, and do we got everything? Did I forget something? Well, they get off the plane, and lo and behold, guess what? Kevin's missing. They can't find Kevin. Mom goes into a panic. She's devastated. We got him at home. She's trying to call friends. Nobody, you know, back then you didn't have cell phones. They were leaving messages on, on everybody's answering machine. They can't go, get anybody to go over and check on them. They're all worried what's going to happen. This, he's around 10 to 12 years old in this movie. And they're panicked. Mom is panicked. The flights are all booked up. It's Christmas Eve and it's just a mess. And mom's panicked and she's offering to buy people's tickets. She's doing anything she can to get on a plane. The rest tells the rest of the family to go. She finally gets a plane, you know, to uh, not to New York, but to someplace else. Then she's trying to get to where that stopped, get another place. She couldn't. She actually took a, 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 a bus. Uh, with some uh, polka players or something. That was hilarious. Anyway, you know, to get there, to try and get back to her son, because that's how panicked she was. And the reason I bring this up is, sometimes when we read Scripture, we pass over something that I think is very important. Because what happens in 41 and 42? 
you know, even though the story of, of Home Alone was about a mischievous little boy, and, and I want to let you also know that he took good care of himself, pretty good care of himself considering his age, but he really took good care of the burglars that were trying to get into his house. I don't want to ruin anything for you if you haven't seen the movie, but it is fun to watch. But this wasn't a story about a mischievous little boy surviving a big city or careless parents who forgot their own son. This is a story of God's son, Jesus, knowing exactly who he was and why he came in the world. It's important for us to stop and see this morning. It was during the Passover that God's people were reminded of God's promise to send the Messiah who would rescue his people from slavery of sin. So the festival came to an end and here they are. They're all packing up. You know, the whole, you know, what I'm going to call it a caravan, a group of people. You know, they weren't on a plane, but they were in this caravan. They had to go back home. Now, can you imagine a whole day goes by? Now, listen, they weren't in a jet in different seats and all over a plane. They were in a caravan together, a family and friends, all from that same town, I would imagine. And here they are going home. 24 hours pass before mom says, hey, anybody seen Jesus? Now, I can only imagine the panic on Mary's face and in her inside of her saying, after she's running around, did you see Jesus? To all her family, did you, did you see Jesus? And all the friends in the caravan that were there with them and traveling with them, did, is Jesus with you? Did you see him? They would have, she would have, they would have been panicked. She would have been panicked. Joseph would have been panicked. Not only did they lose their son, they lost the son of God. Think about it. I mean, Mary knew who he was, right? So she was panicked. She didn't know what to do. So what do they do next? Well, first of all, I want to mention to you, have you not ever lost sight of a child that you were caring for? For even a nanosecond? Let me tell you, if you're in a crowd and you turn around and your child's not there, where you... Where you, you know, like right next to you, and you turn around, and they're gone. It, that nanosecond seems like a lifetime. The panic that goes inside of you, it, I know it has been for me when this has happened. You know, I want, I want to, after it happens, once you want to put a string to them and say, this is never going to happen to me again. You know, because it's panic. It's pure panic. You don't know where they are, what's happened to them. You know, you just, you just worry yourself sick. You know, you have those darting eyes, the questions of relatives and friends, if any of them had seen Jesus as she was going through that. And then you can't help but imagine Mary thinking about who he was, who she actually lost. So they started to retract their steps, which as any of us would do if we lost something, right? Retract your steps. Go back to me. Got to find my keys. Got to find my, you know, my phone, whatever it is. You start to retract your steps. Where was I? Last. So they're going to follow the same path that they took there for a full day. She's going to take it back. They search the city. For, then they get to the city. And he's still not like standing at the gates saying, where's my mommy? No. No, Jesus isn't doing that. Three days they search for him and they can't find him. Now I want to say here, they wasted three days. They should have gone to the temple to begin with. You know, just knowing who Jesus was. But they searched for three days. And when they finally arrived at the temple, and there he was. We're told in verse 46 through 47, it says this. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. These religious experts that were in the temple had what, you know, would have become quite common reaction when listening to Jesus from then on. Think about it. I mean, it was quite common. We, whenever we see him from here forward talking to the, the uh, you know, the, the, the high priest and everything else, he always had this reaction. They were amazed, even when they try and trip him up. This was especially understandable considering Jesus' age. Think about that. He was 12 years old, having this kind of impact on the religious leaders in the temple. We're talking about high priests, well-educated men on the Old Testament. And 
they would have thought to themselves, he showed such maturity and understanding and putting things together. He just wowed all that witnessed it. And at first, Mary and Joseph were also caught up in it. Just for a moment, they get caught up in seeing what's happening. But then their parent part kicked in, didn't it? Mommy and daddy kicked in. Frustrated. Relief, fear, and anger all came together for them. And I, and, and I want us to, to feel a little bit, not only to know what was happening with Jesus, but to feel what was happening with Mary and Joseph. You know, that, 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 that all this stuff was coming together. And what do they say? In verse 48, it says, Son, why have you treated us like this? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Listen, that word distress doesn't do justice to what Mary was saying. It literally means anguish. Anguish, a word that is sometimes even used to describe hell. In other words, why did you put us through this hellish experience? For them, it was terrible. They left their son. He's 12 years old. Three days have gone by. They left him in the city of Jerusalem. And they're, they're devastated, you know. You know, it's that old theory, I think most of us parents, if you haven't gone through it, you will, where you want to spank them and hug them all at the same time. And if you haven't experienced that as a parent, you will. You know, when they dart out into traffic and don't listen to you, and a car's coming by, and, you know, and nothing happens, but you want to spank them, but you want to hug them. See, those kind of experiences, when you lose sight of them for a minute, you know, same kind of feeling inside, and that's what Mary was feeling. This 12-year-old Jesus' response, though, let's look at, let's look from here on, we're going to look at what Jesus is doing pretty much the response is simple and to the point boy isn't that jesus 49b says this didn't you know that i must be in my father's house that's it don't you know i must be in my father's house at first jesus answer might seem somewhat dismissive to his parents concern for their son doesn't it think about that is you know you come and find your son three days later, you're all panicked, you're, you know, you've been running around for three days thinking, thinking the worst, you know, not knowing. And that's what he says to you. <laughs> you know, it's just, it just amazes me, you know, to think, you know, how, you know, Jesus thinks to know that I must be in my father's house. That's all he says. There were, there were these words, but these words, if you look at them carefully, reveal something, uh, even two very important points. Jesus knew exactly who he was. When he says that, that's what that reveals. Even as a 12-year-old boy, Jesus understood that he was the son of God. That's why he says, I must be in my father's house. You know, that, you know uh, it, Jesus understood who he was, and that wasn't a surprising revelation that would later be dropped on him or that he would come to. He fully understood who he was then. And I find that incredibly enlightening. See, not only did Simeon and Anna know who he was, they recognized who he was when he ever entered the temple at 40 days old. They knew he was the Messiah. And here we see, at 12 years old, the same kind of thing happening with, with, to Jesus himself. He knew who he was. The second thing that Jesus' answer reveals is that his parents needed to be reminded of who he was and why he was living in this world. See, they needed to be reminded. Yes, this was their son. But more importantly, he was the son of God. Why did Mary and Joseph need to be reminded of this? I want you to think about it. For 12 years, he had been a little boy, from an infant to 12 years old. A child that they loved, they cared for, like any other child. He learned, he played, he had friends, he ate, he slept, he got up in the morning. He learned to trade from his father. 
was learning a trade from his father. And he, and he continued to. Just like any other kid, Mary and Joseph needed to be a reminder that although Jesus was their son and may have appeared to be like any other child, he was also what? The son of God. And they needed that reminder. Who had been the son of God who had been sent into the world for a very specific person to carry out his father's plan for salvation for all peoples. Did you notice what Mary and Joseph's reaction to Jesus' answer? In verse 50, what does it say? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Does that surprise you? I know how they felt, don't you? Aren't there things in the Bible, think about this, things that happen to us, things in the Bible especially, that we read and we think this, I don't understand. I don't understand how that's possible. Any of you been there? I know I have on many occasions. I don't understand how this is good for me. I don't understand why you would ask me to do this. God, I just don't understand. I think from time to time we all suffer with this. As we suffer with what is it that you do want me to do? And we're not sure. And what is, what is exactly is Jesus doing? Jesus living a perfect life. A life that is complete compliance with God's demands. Jesus' perfect obedience to God's will will continue throughout his entire life as the Bible goes on to tell us. His entire life. The sinless 12-year-old boy from birth, 12 years old, and then as we move forward in the rest of his life, we all know that he lived a perfect life for us. Let me give you an example of something here. It's being that it's Christmas has just gone by. Anybody in here get a gift card? Gift cards? Pretty, pretty common nowadays, and they're wonderful. But you know, there's something about a gift card. Did anybody get a credit card for Christmas? See? No, probably not, right? But, but, yeah. <laughs> but you got to be careful. There's a big difference between these two things. And let me explain that to you. The difference is, when you, when you get a gift card, somebody else has already paid that gift card. So let's say it's a $50 gift card. You know, I give you a $50 gift card. I paid for the, the gift card. I give it to you. When you go spend it, what is it costing you? Nothing. It's a gift. You took the gift. Of, the gift happens to be, we're saying, using today, this morning, $50. So when you go and spend that, what does it cost you? Nothing. It's a present. It's a free gift. But if you use a credit card... When you walk out of there, you didn't pay anything for it, but what's coming? The bill. The bill's coming, and you're going to have to pay it. Now, I like to use that analogy because that's, you know, th you know the difference between a credit card and a gift card, when somebody else has already paid it, you owe nothing. The gift card is so much better than the credit card. Isn't it? I'd much rather have a gift card than I would have the credit card. Through Jesus, through faith in Jesus, you know, uh, he has, in a sense, given you that gift card. That is payment for every one of your sins. That's what the gift card represents. He's given it to you. He's handed it to you and said, here, what does it cost you? Jesus has paid for that sin with a perfect life and a sacrifice of that perfect life at the cross. Because of that gift card from Jesus Christ, God can never demand payment. It's not a credit card. It's a gift. There is no payment from you for your sins. Jesus has already paid it, and he's paid it in full. Amen? Thank God. 
What peace that that, that that brings to us to know that Jesus was fully paid, that he has fully paid for what we owe. That we were right with God because Jesus did everything right in our place. Even as a little boy, and even at a boy at 12 years old in Jerusalem, that's the peace that you heard the Apostle Paul encourage his fellow Christians to have spread throughout every part of their lives as he wrote this, let peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since a member of one body you were called to peace. Colossians 3.15 That's why my prayer for each and every one of us, as we begin this new year, that this might be a year when that peace of Christ rules in our hearts. How does that happen? How does that happen? We're told, listen to this. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Colossians 3.16 What peace needs empowering? And where does that power come from? The message of Jesus Christ, therefore, I would encourage you this next year to do, to do a couple of things. You know about New Year's resolutions, so here they are. Recommit yourself to worshiping with fellow Christians on a weekly basis. Hebrews 10, 24, 25, if you need reference to that, we're not to forsake the assembling together, to worship Christ together. To growing in our knowledge of the Bible through study of God's Word, we call them hope groups. Personal body Bible study plan, family devotions, and an active prayer life. Let's go into the new year, new year with gratefulness for the gift card that Jesus has given us. Jesus Christ, he has given to you what he's given to you. May it guide you and do everything in the do. Let us do everything in the in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, I want to end with a happy New Year as I pray that this message may have touched you in some way as we prepare to do some um, New Year's resolutions. May you depart from the normal resolutions that we like to make about health weight, uh, habits that we're trying to get rid of, and make that list that I gave you your New Year's resolution to get closer uh, with each other, to get closer to God, and to spend more time together. So together, as we get closer to God, we will reach out further. I think they all goes hand in hand. Let's pray. Lord, Father, I just thank you for this time together. Lord, that you've given each and every one of us, Lord, that, uh, that we can come and worship you. Lord, knowing what you did, Lord, even at 12 years old, Lord, how you, Lord, you just, you knew where you were supposed to be. You said, am I supposed to be in my father's house? And Lord, that temple is our church, Lord, and that's where we need to be. Lord, you ask us to do that. And Lord, I just pray for each and every one that's here. Lord, as they hear the words that were, uh, that were expressed through your book, Lord, and what was going on in Mary and Joseph's life, uh, Lord, and what was Jesus was doing, that we would just get closer to you. Lord, that we want to snuggle up with you. As just as the same as, uh, Lord, as Kevin's mom and them got home, they embraced their son and were so happy he was safe and sound. Uh, Lord, I know Joseph and Mary were also happy that Jesus was safe and sound. But Lord, more importantly for us, he's safe and sound and paid a price that nobody else could pay. Lord, that we may stand before you, a perfect and just God, loving us in spite of the defects because Jesus died for, loved us so much that he died for our sins. Father, thank you for that. Lord, we pray all these things in your precious name.